Maybe I should mention some positive signs that we have, and the European Commission actually, together with our European Association uh, and some of the agencies, enforcement agencies in the country, started a project called Atlete, which is available on the web. Atlete 1 tested 70 refrigerators on the market and published the result on the website so everyone can see how they complied. Now they are doing Atlete 2 on washing machines. So I think the European Union and the Commission can have a role as well to show I mean, not to take over the enforcement role of the national authorities, but to show that it is possible to do enforcement. It is not too difficult. It can be done, and it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally also, uh, we, uh, in our industry, we have a process called bilateral verification process, where the uh, members of our European association, it's controlled by lawyers and auditors, can actually, it's a flow chart, challenge each other if they suspect that their labels are not correct. But it's extremely complex to manage that process, to be honest. It's a heavy cumbersome issue. Okay. Um, so, a year in um, implementation, uh, I think review, what, 2016? 2016. Yeah. It's our first review, yeah. Okay, and, um, and from the past 12 months, what do, you, what do you envisage for things that need to be changed, tweaked? Well, I mean, I think, you know, this meeting shows that, I mean, only a year in is quite early on in this whole cycle. And, of course, you know, because people don't buy tyres that often any more than they buy white goods. And I think the experience of white goods about the length of time and the way it's evolving, we need to, to learn on. So, uh, I mean, we are collecting information all the time. Uh, we do have on the table, um, which I'm hoping that we will get through in this parliament with the agreement of the member states, a reform of the whole market surveillance procedure in which tyres will come under. Uh, which aims to reinforce this whole information sharing between member states and pooling of information, and particularly an alert mechanism if they find a dangerous product uh, in, in any country, so that that, that uh -huh. has to go on, and that could well be possible in, in the case of tyres. Uh, I mean, it could be sort of construction defects and, uh, or anything else. So, so, all, so all of those sort of things will be entirely complementary. But an alert mechanism between companies who then inform each other, who then inform. Well, uh, but also if the if the surveillance authorities, for example, uh, find um, a defective tyre or one that has dangerous chemicals in, then they will alert all the other surveillance authorities, who can then act to take something off the market. I mean, the whole point about the market surveillance is that you have an alert system for unsafe products. Now, generally, that hasn't applied up to now with tyres. It's tended to apply with other products, uh, machinery or toys and so on. But there is a rapid, uh, so-called rapid alert system for taking dangerous products off the market. Uh, but, but on the other hand, you know, information about, about mislabeling also can, could also be part of this exchange of information. We've just had, yeah, we just had this question in from, uh, I think it's from France. We keep on hearing of tyres from Asia. Uh, and having to achieve those three criteria, unfortunately, it proves to be dreadful underperformance when it comes to longevity or dry road braking. Have the guests stumbled upon these tyres in terms of that, specifically from cheaper tyres? Uh, well, I mean, as we said earlier, I mean, every tyre has to meet a, a minimum standard performance for dry road performance and safety anyway. So, right. I mean, if they're not meeting the core performance, they shouldn't be placed on the market anyway. So there is a sort of threshold test there. Okay. But, I mean, I think the points you made leave the broader issue about where, where the, the whole tyre performance issue is going to move forward. Uh, and, therefore, I think that the sort of information that's coming in from the distribution chain and market structures and so on. And I just go back to the point that a, a lot of the issues behind this whole movement were to improve uh, fuel efficiency. In other words, it was a sustainability measure. Uh, so we need to see that, that people are taking the sustainability measures in, in view as well. In other words, they're buying tyres that hopefully will improve fuel consumption. Um, so all of that needs, needs to be taken into account in how this moves forward. And I think the industry itself needs to look at the experience of other industries and say, well, should we as a group of manufacturers be investing some money in some sort of programme like a European tyre assessment programme, for example, in line with, the, with what's happened with motor vehicles? Uh, and you know, the Commission was certainly involved in that as a, as a safety measure. So, you know, there are lots of possibilities, I think, now that we've started this process. Uh, Goran, um, what would you like to see under consideration for the 2016 uh, review? I think it's, it's too early to make a final, final assessment. So, I think we started not well, as I said, and, but we are progressing. Yeah, I mean, why, why was this introduced in November? I mean, when half of <laughs> Europe is, is wanting information on winter time. <laughs> Well, I, I think that was just the timing when the legislation came in, I have to say. Uh, so, I'm, you know, I... I'm, it's bonkers, I, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, everyone's just thinking, well, you know, um, well, this is something I might look at in six months' time, maybe. But, well, yeah. 
I mean, there, is, there are always issues around legislation about the demands that you put on people to, to achieve, you know, advances for consumers. Uh, I mean, I'm actually in favour of having a sort of common introduction date for, for European legislation sort of every six months so people know when it comes in. Well, first that first of April. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what about other ideas for, 20, uh, for 2016? Um, Michael? I think it was probably mentioned in a part what Goran said. Um, so um, I'd say if you compare winter tyre to summer tyre, so for the winter tyre, the label is not, uh, as it, we have it right now, it's not the perfect information, I would say, for the end user. So um, I think before we think on uh, put additional uh, performances inside, we probably think on uh, 2016 how we can, let's say, give the customer end user uh, valuable information also for winter tires because right now it's not really valuable and he needs to stay to compare winter and winter tires. So probably he gets confused if you see a summer tire label and the winter tire label, he probably will not understand. Yeah, I mean, it, what is the situation? It was, it, it was Lee's point, sort of talking about this label being maybe a sort of gateway thing. You know, I mean, do you think that this could lead to a label with 10? You know, I mean, still quite simple, but with a few, with a few more things added in there? Or a link, maybe, just to something online, just saying, right, you know, this is, this is how we do it. Just, let's say, to put something additional on the label. I think there are two, two from my perspective, there are two, two uh, topics inside. So the one thing is, okay, when the customer gets really confused about the information and he needs some, some backup um, by the dealer or whatever, that's one part. But you need to consider for each test you want to put in, you need to implement also a procedure that, it is com that you can compare it and to put in, let's say, a performance inside, which is then possible not to compare it on the same level, like say for market surveillance or whatever, then there is no value behind. So and to create these kind of procedures takes some time and you need to be careful because it costs a lot of money in the end of the day. Okay. Uh, just to say, if you're watching online, do keep your questions coming in. We've just got another one from France and Italy as well. Uh, you just need to click here and we'll put these questions uh, to our guests. Are there any questions from the floor at the moment, just before we uh, move on, it's blind as a bat. I can't see if anyone's raising their hand. No, any anything from? No. Okay. Let's um, let's move on though to the. Um, we're drawing to a close in about sort of fifteen twenty minutes time. But the marketing opportunities uh, for this as well, and I wonder if that's something which interests any of you in the um, the, the audience. Um, should we, I mean, Victor, in terms of the marketing opportunities that the white label um, scheme led to, can you just talk us through some of that? I mean, we mentioned a bit about grade inflation, you know, with people getting very confused, but presumably these are, these, these are tools and penetration you've got as a, as a marketing device now. Yeah, that's exactly what I said, was offsetting this whole thinking that it has a cost or how should we inform the consumer. I think that went pretty much automatically, and I, I left a little bit here when I heard about the introduction in November. It was a bad start, but, you know, in three years that will be all forgotten. And I think if the label has been, but I don't know the details exactly of the numbers behind that label, but if it works the same way we have at our label, the product started at F&G 20 years ago, moved on gradually up, everyone competed, put better and better products on the market. We then found ourselves uh, for washing machines and dishwashers about seven years ago, having around more than 50% of the products in A. And we were then thinking, what are we going to do now? Should we stop product development? Uh, obviously not. So a marketing message then became, well, I have A minus 30%. It was put in the catalog, but not obviously on the label. Um, then that made the commission realize we need to update the label in some way because we're running out of classes. And it's actually quite ironic that when the whole scheme was started, no one thought about what happens if and when we go out of the class A, you know, what, what comes after that? Yeah. So we just put the upper level of A, which, you know, what, there is no letter on top of A, what should we do? It was a long, long discussion then. It took about, I would say, even seven years of delay to update the whole thing. Uh, we then got, we know, in the seven, uh, second version of the washing machine label, where finally it was added A+, plus, A++, double plus, and A++, triple plus, on top of the old scale. Um, well, one can have its opinion about that. But the good thing is that when you change the label, unfortunately, we have a two-year situation with all the stocks and all the retailers that still have all the appliances in. And if we would downgrade the scale with new numbers behind it, there would be one machine which says A and another one next to it C, but it's the same machine. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's totally confusing. Mm -hmm. So at least by adding the A+, plus, triple plus, and so on on top, the old label is compatible with the new one, and I just new classes on top. 
Unfortunately, now we just launched, I shouldn't say unfortunately, of course I'm happy about it, but Electrolux launched a triple plus minus 50% washing machine. <laughs> so here we, here we are again. Huh? What should we do now? And of course it needs to be revised again, and that discussion has already started with the European Commission. The whole scheme is under review. And what should now be done with that scale? And everyone so is we, 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 wait another, we wait another seven years for that one? Well, I hope yeah. not, but uh, something has to be done. And we are, we are marketing as a triple plus minus 50% in our marketing material, but on the label you will only see a triple plus, obviously, because that's the official label. So that, that's not a really uh, optimum situation. The framework directive for labeling that applies also to, to the tires says that there cannot be more than a triple plus on top. Then it stops. Lee, um, marketing opportunities uh, for you, and, and why do you bother making low-grade tyres anymore? I, I think the legislator definitely welcome. I think you would agree, learn from the experience in, in the white goods industry, because the, the A grading, the levels of the A are very aspirational. They are put at the time when the legislation was adopted, there was no tyre found uh, uh, to have an A grade. So I, I, I think the, the bar was put extremely high, uh, which is good, it's very aspirational, it drives the industry in a certain direction, so I, I think it will take some time to see a, an overall uh, development towards uh, AA, and on top of it, uh, in the audience it, it was mentioned by Mrs. Sineral from ETRMA that um, what, what started as an energy efficiency uh, act was combined with a safety element because we know that there is a trade-off between rolling resistance and, and wet grip. And it's, it's really a, a big technological challenge to, to, to go uh, and improve on both criteria at the same time. Uh, you need a lot of, of, of innovation for that. So I think tomorrow we'll not see the whole market being AA. There are, of course, uh, AAs in the market and, and excellent uh, BA products. But I think we learned from the legislation and also the fact of this, this technological challenge to combine rolling resistance with red grip, it will take some time uh, for the market to develop. Okay. Um, Luca? Uh, I think the first things to do is increase awareness on the label because it's true we have the, the side of the industry and, and the side of the grading of, of the label, but we have to make sure that consumers... So I'm not fully convinced about this 70%, honestly at least at, at European level. It's true, when you have more information in the country, you will have more attitude of consumers to go for a label. But, but in some other countries, I still believe that the, the price is still key in, in, uh, in, in deciding which, which tires. And at the same time, we need to run demonstration program. We need to, to, to show concretely to end users and customer the performance of the different tires. This is uh, the, the way forward we see, and uh, and probably also to start comparing independent tests with the labeling because it's quite new. This uh, this approach. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting because I mean a lot of questions just coming in now actually, um, saying that if you're going to be um, buying winter tyres, is there any point you're looking at this label at all? You know, if you're if you're going to be buying tyres this month or next month, Goran, is there is there any point in any of your customers saying? Look at the label. In winter tyre, we have different criteria, so it's not... But, but, but so when yeah. they're doing that, I mean, the, the question is, uh, what can the panel recommend now in November? Look at the label or not. Ignore this label, then. Just buy a separate winter tyre. But ignore or not, I would say, so that, that it's a little bit we have a spread out of the summer tyre business to the winter tyre business. But to be honest, the tyre dealer go in the argumentation more for the winter tyre criteria. But it's spread out. If you have a good brands, in, in, if you have a good grades in, uh, in the summer tyre, so the expectation is that the winter tyre is also good. So there is a connectivity there. Mm. But um, pure winter tyre, there is no no. Uh, Connectivity to no, 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 no connection at all. Um, Michael, ha has, has this legislation been, be, been a good thing? Um, I think yes, because let's say maybe if we go three years back, so probably the end user did not, or the majority did not really take care about tires. So he probably did not know that there is a significant difference between the brands. So this is mainly the cause why, because up to now the prices quite very important but right now he can judge by help by using the label to say okay is it okay for me to improve safety improve economy just by spending and 40 euros we, more have we seen anything materially different uh, yeah well, uh, well i mean i rely on the data that's coming from the marketplace but i think i just want to come back to this issue about um, about fuel, uh, fuel efficiency and performance, which it was thought it was all about. Um, we had a, a question earlier from Stephen uh, Stacey about the price of the tyre. 
of course, I mean, if, if I were doing a marketing for this, I mean, I would give all my tyre dealers a ready reckoner related to the price of fuel in their own particular market, which, of course, is continuing to go up, to say, if you buy this tyre in grade B as opposed to this car in grade D, you will save X hundred euros a year, depending on your mileage. Now, I mean, that would probably more than um, amortise the cost of buying a more expensive tyre. So in terms of marketing, you know, this is an opportunity here. Uh, now, this is a slightly more complex opportunity, and it, and it means that the, the tyre suppliers themselves, the tyre distributors, the tyre dealers, are probably not used necessarily to presenting their products in these terms, but this is exactly what should be happening. And I mean, I think the domestic appliance uh, story is a really interesting one, because you, I, I would argue that the public policy aims of labelling are clearly been delivered. Because the whole objective was to say to consumers, when you buy a washing machine, look at washing performance by all means, but remember this uses energy because you use it every day. And therefore, look at energy performance. And, and the consumers have therefore driven a significant improvement in energy performance in domestic appliances. Now, there is no reason to suggest whatsoever that the same thing won't happen here. But I think because these products are intrinsically more complex... Uh, and they have a much more varied distribution chain, which is not a sort of consumer-focused distribution chain in the way that if you go and buy a domestic appliance it is. It's going to take time to do that. But I think it's the onus on the industry to be looking at this in how they're calibrating their marketing programs, how they're training people, how they're talking about the benefits of this. And, and it, it is still relatively, you know, we're only a year into it, um, and this is, I think, a relatively slow moving industry in terms of the distribution side, not in terms of the tyre technology. Uh, but I think you know, the tyre technology needs to run behind that. And we can help them in terms of trying to improve the way that the market surveillance works. But realistically, the industry itself is the one that's going to have to invest and take control over this. Is that, is that something that you'd be recommending to your dealers, then? But it's not so easy like a washing machine, a tyre, because you have different drivers, you have different streets, and to, if you argue for uh, fuel efficiency, we will do it, but we have not a programme behind to check it, to give him a evidence for it that he so, saves so, the so money. So does Malcolm if, understand, does, it, does Malcolm understand <laughs> yes. what you're dealing with, or is he looking yes, at it from, but, uh, a, from I think, an Olympian I think sort of... We are, yeah. we are uh, now 12 months with yeah. the labelling, so we have not, quite, uh, not uh, enough uh, data experience to go for this. Mm. I think what is changed, what I said, is that we have three common criteria, so we can compare this with the, with the different brands, with the criteria we can argue, but we have not enough data to go to the big fleet and say, OK, you will save so many money with this new tyre. OK, and, and Lee, do you, do, do, would you subscribe to that? I mean, do you think that if you did have a Ray Reckoner and you said, OK, how many miles are you doing each year, 15,000 miles, 10,000 miles, whatever, this is going to save you, this is going to save you X? I mean, that, that, that's quite a big, attractive sell, isn't it? Yeah, in, in our marketing activations, we definitely use this element because indeed you can, uh, for a consumer tire, you can save up to 300 euros, which is extremely mean, meaningful. And we try to put that forward in, 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 uh, in the way we, we market the product uh, today. Um, I, I think for us, what we see is there are two channels that uh, consumers use to get aware of, of the label. It's, it's internet, where we really... Uh, focus on to make sure that the information is, is, is given, but also point of sales with the dealers. And for us, we, we're going to continue to, to uh, focus on those channels to make sure that uh, the 50% that are not aware yet today of, of, of the tire label um, uh, will be aware in one year's time. And don't forget, also, it was said before, um, a consumer only buys every two year two years a, a tire, so we're only one year uh, in, into the labelling world, so I'm very optimistic uh, to see a, a much bigger awareness in, uh, in a year's time. Fuel economy, a any questions on, on that linked to the, the labelling from the room? Any, any other thoughts on that, sir? Yeah. My name is Peter Schmidt from uh, Reifenwald newspaper in Germany. And uh, my question is about uh, how many uh, criteria do you need and how many criteria are important? And uh, I know that many customers ask for mileage. Um, how important do you think is that? To add at the label or to drop um, one other? Um, so um, how important is the sound? because we have a sound index 
on the tire as well. Um, yeah, that's to, it. To, to, to Michael or to... Um... Uh, in the round. Okay, yes. Okay, well, that, let's start with you, Michael. Um, just come to, to the where. Um, from, from the technical perspective or from the end point of, uh, of the view of the end consumer, the where would be, of course, very interesting, very valuable. But um, I have really concerns um, how to make it, this test comparable and to bring it into, also into a, in, in an okay, economic way to test it really seriously. Because, of course, you can imagine that the tire 195, 65, 15 had a completely different lifetime than probably a 225, 45, 17, even if it's the same brand on it. So you need to test each tire. And so far, the majority of testing capacity is done on road. So that means we would increase um, the test driving on road. And you need to drive maybe 10,000 kilometers with each set of tires. So we, there we should really take into consideration the global impact. And you need, of course, you need to develop a kind of a test procedure which allows somebody, authority or independent test company to check if this label is also okay. Um, I would say yes, this would be valuable um, information for the end consumer from my point of view, but um, at present I do not see how we can make it practicable and also economical because in the end of the day probably the end user needs to pay uh, this test. And, and Goran, just, just, just a thought from you. I mean, is, is that one of the principal questions that people ask you? Is this going to give me 12,000 miles, 15,000 yes, miles? Yes. Is, is, is a question. Yes, it's true. And so we have, I think we have a, a technical background to explain the customers uh, which tyre is the best tyre for him. And we ask him how is the uh, behaviour uh, in driving and how many kilometres he drives and what is important. In the US market, for instance, the mileage program is a key for them. So in Germany, it's not the key. So there is no demand on it. So look, we're, we're sort of wrapping up. In just in, yeah, go. I mean, just on this one. In fact, the mileage has been one of the issues that we have also looked at at the beginning of this trial. Really. And exactly for the reason that you gave, the consumer can knows about the mileage. And in fact, in fact if he is not. Uh, it is something that he can master, he, can, he knows about it, he is told about the mileage information, so if he is not happy, he can also make the decision for the next time he buys. So this is an information he doesn't need to be told on the label. And today, I completely concur with my colleague of TÜV, there is no way of testing, measuring, and I think we should really stay away from any performance that cannot be measured. Already we have trouble, and with all respect to the domestic appliances, I think tires are really extremely um, sophisticated and dependent on so many other parts, it's part of a system in the end. Road, driver, vehicle, so it's only one component. So, so, so really, I mean, at the end of what's been like an hour and a half discussion about this, you know, I think most people here would seem to say that the EU tire labeling system ha has been necessary and a success. It was set out on very green, um, on a green agenda, but also to sort of demystify the whole process of buying tyres and what is the best uh, uh, tyre for your vehicle. But what seems to me, as an outsider this morning, is that actually it's opened up so many different areas and how complicated the actual tyre manufacturing business is, and that for consumers to actually find out what is best for their vehicle, they need to spend quite a lot of time analysing and discussing these things as, as well. Are there any other thoughts from the room before I... Um, close and just thank our guests. Uh, sir, just a, a quick agenda. Agen um, no, my question was not only about mileage, um, it was uh, also about sound. Um, we have a sound uh, criteria on the label, um, but my question is, is it really necessary because we have a, a sound index on the tyre as well? Okay, Lee. Our research shows today that noise is, is uh, external noise uh, is, is the less relevant criteria uh, for, for the consumer today. So to answer your question, yes, when grip and rolling resistance are more important than noise, that's what we see today. All right, we are um, out of time. I, well, <laughs> Malcolm, just in, in well, five well, words. Uh, yeah, well, politicians always like to have a last-ish sort of word. Um, <laughs> just I'm, to I'm, say, I'm giving you five. Are you giving me, okay. Um, no, just to say, I think... Uh, 
it's really healthy that we're having a proper evaluation of legislation, which doesn't always happen in my case. So I think from my, I can say from my colleagues who worked on this, I'm chairman of the committee, so I, and so I was involved in leading the process. But my colleagues who worked on this, I think, are very pleased that such attention is being played on something that we've done. Um, but we will be keen to improve it. And part of the new procedures we have under the Lisbon Treaty is that, um, is that the European Parliament is involved in monitoring the implementation of legislation. We can send observers to meetings with experts around this. Uh, and I think it's very healthy. And so I would encourage you to keep information flowing into us uh, even though you know this was done in 2000, uh, this was done in 2010, I think, for 2012 implementation. We'll remember the November date now, but you know this will be a continuing process. So I encourage you to keep my colleagues informed. Victor, Malcolm, Goran, Michael, Lee, and uh, Luca, thank you all very much. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. That is where we're going to end. We're going to stop the uh, online broadcast now at half past. Uh, any of you who need a press kit, if you haven't picked it up already, uh, do pick that up. And uh, please use the click here button on online to let us know your details as well if you want to be kept informed. Uh, we're going to have lunch um, served shortly. Uh, we've got this room booked for the rest of the afternoon, so please uh, you know, take some tea, have a, a fruit juice chat, uh, raise some more questions if you want to with the panel, some of whom will be staying, but others I think have to go straight back to meetings. But thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us this morning. Thank you.